Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Dedicated Show. We have a special guest with us today who is a packed author. He wrote the book, Machine Learning for Algorithmic Trading. Can you guess who it is? Wait, I'll cover his face. Let's see if you can guess. He thinks the whole world knows him already. So let's see if you can, uh, if you can, if you know who I'm going to be speaking with, put his name in the comments. Really looking forward to this session. Um, the, the, the person we have on the show is Stefan Jansen, and he was on the dedicated show probably about a year ago. I can look back and confirm, but excited to have him back. It was a really fun session before, and we have some new topics to talk about this time. But yet again, we are here to talk about machine learning for algorithmic trading. And before we bring on our special guest, I want to let you know that PACT is kind enough to participate in another book giveaway. So if you'd like to play, all you have to do is put hashtag PACT into the comments of LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, or Twitch, wherever you're joining us from. And as always, we're going to do this fun automated raffle to see who the lucky winners are. We'll announce um, a winner uh, how about halfway through the show and then again towards the end of the show. So make sure you stay tuned. We are also taking questions from the live audience. So if you have any questions that you've been thinking about um, in terms of algorithmic trading, let's see, machine learning, um, writing a book, anything that you want to know personally about Stefan Jansen, he has agreed to reveal it all on my show. I can see him smiling backstage. So um, yes, definitely make sure you ask us any questions and leave comments throughout the session as well to let us know you're here, let us know your thoughts. Without further ado, I'm going to bring on our guest speaker here. Oh, there you are. Hey. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely excited to have you here. I'm just looking in to see who's joined us. We have a bunch of people saying packed, packed, packed. It's like they're chanting mm -hmm. packed's name. I love it. Um, I see lot Kimberly, of lots of familiar, familiar faces in there. Um, thank you all for joining us. Really, really excited to have you all here with us today. Before we get into the topic, I know, Stefan, you were on the show before, but yes. for those who might not know you, can you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Yeah. Um, so my name is Stefan Jensen. I'm German originally, now again based in New York. I just returned. We spent a year in um, exile in Texas, uh, in Austin, where I'd also been before. Um, currently, um, or for the last five, six years or so, uh, I have a company that works with clients in different industries to help them introduce data science and machine learning into the organization. Uh, that's partly investing and trading and, you know, partly all sorts of other stuff. And um, before that, I was a partner in an investment firm um, that was targeting consumer goods, long-term investment, uh, very data-driven. And I built the um, the sort of data infrastructure and uh, analytics, uh, predictive, predictive analytics practice, right, with a few data scientists and new data sets and all this. Uh, and that was sort of in the relatively early days when data science was kind of starting to uh, be taken serious in the investment industry. Um, mm -hmm. Before that, I was in fintech, and way before that, I worked in international development. Um, so I've been around the world a little bit, um, but now I'm in New York doing machine learning. Great. Well, awesome, awesome, and have, very happy to have you back on our show here today. Uh, let's see. We've got Ben joining us from Lone Star, uh, Texas State. We've got people coming in from New Jersey. I'm in New Jersey now, so I've moved out of New York since we last spoke. Um, and it's so nice and quiet here. So... <laughs> <laughs> so the topic of the day, we're going to talk about machine learning for algorithmic trading. And I think it's always good to, to set the stage, right? So when I'm thinking of machine learning for algorithmic trading, what does that actually encompass? Yeah. Um, so we can sort of take it from the end, right? So there's trading, right? Which, you know, we know is sort of buying and selling of, of assets, typically on exchanges. Uh, that can also be elsewhere. Then there's this algorithmic part uh, where, you know, an algorithm is kind of a set of rules that uh, a machine can sort of execute step by step to, you know, take certain actions. So in this case, it would be buying and selling uh, based on certain rules. And the interesting thing with machine learning is that now a machine learns the rules from data and it's trained so that it sort of gets better and better in achieving some sort of performance measure, uh, which, you know, in the trading context, of course, would be your profit at loss, uh, hopefully profit at the end of whatever period. 
So, so basically, that's what machine learning for training would be about, or algorithmic training, you know, to develop a system that more or less automatically um, uh, executes buy and sell orders um, uh, to make profit based on some data. Now, that's mm -hmm. kind of a very broad description, you know. In practice, it can be many different things. Uh, it can sort of range from I have a model that helps me predict returns, but there are still maybe manual rules uh, that decide uh, maybe I'm just going to buy the top and bottom whatever 10 percent of the ranking that my model uh, predicts you know or, or i could have something that's way more sophisticated like a reinforcement learning agent that literally learns the entire process uh from like how much should i buy of each stock and when should i sell it and that probably based on some model in the background that predicts return but it, there are more decisions to take in the process right it's not just which stocks should i uh, invest in for instance you know if it's equities but it's also how big should the uh, the, the positions uh, be and things like that you know uh, how should i mix the stocks you know risk management and all these things right so you could uh, you could think and the large uh, very successful hedge funds they are building systems that are more akin to something that is end to end automated Okay, basically, so what you're saying, the audience that have joined us today will learn how to make a billion dollars by whatever you teach them here today. Is that right? You just got to be faster than the next guy. So get on it right now. Get the book, read it. And, you know, by 1130, it might already be a little late. So. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah, we've got people saying that they already found their next book to read. So awesome. Um, people are going to pick up the book. Uh, I think it's always such an honor to meet the author of the book, right? And especially this book. I mean, you can even work, use it for working out. It, it, is, uh, it is pretty massive. And I think let's spend a few minutes just talking about the book. Yeah. Um, I know we talked about this a bit in our, in our first show, but remind the audience, why did you write this? Sort of what was the thought process and who is the book for? Yeah. So one of the motivations um, to get involved in this was I used to I've been teaching generally for quite some time, right? Economics earlier and then data science uh, for a few years at General Assembly, for instance, here in, in New York uh, or data camp and so forth. And um, I especially while teaching at General Assembly here in New York, uh, there were always quite a few people that actually worked in investments, you know, folks from hedge funds or investment banks, et cetera, right? And um, they were getting a fairly generic uh, training in data science, right? Because of course there are these like generic things that you can teach, you know, like, oh, I want to predict the color of the iris uh, or cluster them and, and things like that. But then you have a whole different set of knowledge that, uh, really applies to financial data, right? Machine learning is all about data. So you want to know a little bit about the specificity of uh, or the domain specific aspects um, of, of the data. And these courses never really touched on that, right? Mm -hmm. So I always was thinking at the time, these people, there, there's a different way of talking about machine learning in the context of, of trading that involves everything. Like how do markets work? What do I have to know about financial data to actually use them properly? Right. And also, how do I deal with the specific challenges in the context of, of financial markets, which, you know, tend to be efficient. So very little signal in historical data, lots of noise. Uh, that's not always the same. If I try to uh, recognize an object, an image, uh, cats and dogs are not nearly as noisy. Right. Yeah. As, as price patterns in terms of where does the stock or whatever the asset is go tomorrow. So, so these are all very specific challenges that are really serious. They're not like, a, you know, you can't deal with this with a little text box on the side, you know, and say, well, actually, everything we're teaching, it doesn't really apply. But, you know, the general principles still hold. So, so that was kind of part of the motivation. And since I've been doing this before for a few years in the context of this investment firm, I, you know, I thought it would be kind of nice to put some of this uh, on paper. And the book reflects this a little bit in that it, in the second edition contains quite a bit of sort of intro into machine learning as well. So the assumption is that, well, uh, you may know a little bit about machine learning, but it might be helpful to get the background on how models work and sort of a little bit of the theory behind this. You know, it's not a theoretical book, I would say, but it does cover these things to some extent and references other sources, you know, and then always demonstrates, well, now if you want to apply this uh, to financial data, then here's an example how this would work. And um, it also goes very much into this end-to-end -end workflow, right? Because this this kind of modeling kind of aspect of the workflow where you, you know, get your data and work with them and then predict something like returns. And then there's the actual trading aspect and it's only really useful um, or you can only really evaluate how good a model is if you understand how useful the predictions would have been had you actually traded on it. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So that's where this whole backtesting uh, aspect comes in, you know. And so there's, you can't really say, well, my, the correlation of the returns where the outcomes was X, so, you know, I'm going to make money. That mm -hmm. isn't really telling you as much as, well, could I actually have traded those, da, 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 right? So there are all these practical aspects. So the book goes into this as well and tries to demonstrate how, you, how to think uh, about this end-to-end -end and how to also work with this um, in practice, you know. Okay. So, yeah. Thank Thank you for for that explanation. I'm also wondering, since there's quite a bit of um, code in the book, do you think there's a prerequisite for the reader to have some programming language knowledge? I mean, the book uses Python, and uh, it would certainly help quite a bit and avoid some frustration if you already knew, for instance, how to work with pandas. You know, if mm -hmm. you basically literally wake up one day uh, and all you've used before was say Excel, and now you read that maybe quant trading and automating things with Python is the future. Let's use this book to kind of deal with this all. It might be a little tough, right? It's asking a little lot, uh, a little much. So, so you know, there are very there are so many resources to kind of get started with these things. I'd recommend doing this first. It's not that the code is like super complicated and it goes into like sophisticated software architecture and algorithmic optimization stuff. Not really. It basically mm -hmm. uses libraries, right? So there's a lot of just calling libraries to execute things. But still, you know, you want to be fluent enough that you don't get hung up on, oh, how do I actually write this code? What does that actually mean? And da -da 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 -da, stuff like that, you know? Right. That makes sense. Um, OK, so I'm going to take a couple questions from the live audience here. First question from George Fierkin. He is asking, are there specific public machine learning algorithms used for trading or are they all proprietary? Well, so, th so that actually goes very much to the heart of, of the matter here, right? So the book is written as a, um, sort of a toolbox, right, that uses algorithms, right? Say, I don't know, gradient boosting is an algorithm, right? It has okay. been published and uh, is known and has been implemented in code that is open source, right? That's the algorithm. Now, you want to use that algorithm, which you can also use to predict, I don't know, the success of a marketing campaign or what have you, right? Now, you want to use this to predict returns. The proprietary aspect is, well, what are the input data? How do I use the input data to feed them into the model? How do I, what kind of returns am I actually predicting the next minute, the next hour, the next day, the next month, you know? All of these kind of uh, go into the ultimately proprietary setup of this end-to-end, -end, uh, if you want to call it end-to-end -end pipeline, you know, of data selection, um, feature engineering, and then multi uh, the, the actual model training in its specific form and so forth, right? And then later, of course, the actual trading strategy, right? Because even if two people that have the same model with the same prediction could yeah. take very different decisions on how they actually trade on this, go only long, go long short, different holding periods, etc. right? So there's so many different other parameters. All of these are proprietary, but the one thing that's public is the actual algorithm. Mm -hmm. At least as a starting point, you might even want to refine that, right? You could, of course, come up with your own gradient boosting variation. Right? That's also possible, but that's maybe not the principal aspect here. Okay, uh, thank you. So I have an easy question for you, and then maybe a more difficult one. Let's start with the uh, well, let's start with the easy ones from Bharat. Uh, he's asking, does the the book cover how we can apply some of these concepts to personal finance or personal investments? Uh, I mean the book is geared towards um, selecting individual assets um, for a limited holding period. Uh, so to trade maybe on a daily basis, every five days, you can set it up to, deal on a, to, to trade on a monthly basis. Some people do a lot much longer here uh, peri uh, holding periods, right? I mentioned earlier that, uh, for instance, we were working in an investment company where the goal was really to uh, hold consumer uh, equities over month and month and even years. And there, actually, the goal uh, of your prediction was not so much the return of the stock, but actually the prediction of how the markets would do. So the actual um, uh, economies where certain companies were doing business, right? So how would consumers develop in different parts of the world, right? So you could, you know, set up something like this for yourself. Now, of course, that is quite a bit of effort if all you do is invest, you know, a certain amount of of, uh, of, of funds and don't want to be spending hours and hours <laughs> managing these funds, right? So in right. theory, clearly it's applicable. In practice, you know, you might find it a little uh, labor intensive um, at some point uh, for that purpose, you know? Yeah, makes sense. Okay, ready for the more difficult question? Well, I don't know, I think it'd be difficult. 
Um, let's see. If like, you where does the market go tomorrow? <laughs> no, no. no, what has been your best trade or investment idea? Um, yeah, good question. I mean, so um, there are many different aspects to this, right? Um, and some are. The only ones I could sort of mention was maybe in the context of this in investment. So, so one thing is clearly to high level say what works best is ultimately data driven. So, so I work with clients that have access to to some sort of proprietary data feed uh, or a very proprietary uh, way of utilizing data, and that is a very good starting point, right? Um, then, on the other hand. Um, they are simply, uh, and this is actually kind of similar, um, you know, uh, if you get, ultimately markets are efficient, right? So so you need to get some insight that few people have and maybe get a perspective on on that insight that differs from what other people think, you know? So, so the other good investment ideas, I was always impressed in the, especially like a few years ago, when people were going deep into emerging markets and researching how these markets work and how companies were doing, because it takes some actual legwork, you know, especially in the past, these were not as, as transparent, so you could do quite well, uh, and also in a fairly interesting way if you actually like to kind of get around the world and do things like this. So, so some interesting pieces would come mm -hmm. out of something like that. You know, of course, it would have been a great idea to buy Bitcoin ten years ago. You know, um, you uh, didn't. Which, uh, what do you no, mean? Which I, did, which I did not, even though people were <laughs> suggesting. But I was, of course, the good old economist, dismissive. Now this is not a currency. This is not going to work. Well, it might still fail, but it's been yeah. doing quite well. So yes, yes. Um, okay, so what will the market look to, like tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> it's going up. It's going down right now. So tomorrow it's going up, I think. Okay. By the dip. <laughs> um, another question here. So what is the no day investment day advice? No investment. <laughs> what are the day to day activities performed by algo trader, data scientist and machine learning? So and also what are some future opportunities look like? Yeah, I mean, so the, the sort of the day-to-day -day activities uh, have very much to do with the various uh, elements of this sort of end-to-end -end workflow, right? Because if you start at some point, say you join a firm that actually uses machine learning to make investment decisions, right? In that context, there will already be some models in place. These models will make some predictions and one or several models in combination will be used to at least influence the portfolio manager's decision process, right? Uh, there are not that many firms that do this completely automated. You know, very often there are portfolio managers that use uh, or look at signals uh, that models uh, output and then, you know, use that information to, to buy or sell. So once you're in that process, then of course you need to iterate all the time, right? Because on the one hand, you need to monitor whether the models continue to perform as well as they used to when you know you first developed them. And then you need to prepare for the signals that the models generate for these signals to ultimately decay. So that means you need to constantly be researching new ways of extracting value from data or looking at new data sets and, and things like this. So it's literally iterating over what you already have in place to keep it performing as well uh, as it's supposed to. Mm -hmm. Future opportunities uh, are really manifold, right? Because again, it's ultimately data-driven. So uh, utilizing more and more different data in smart ways is one key driver of opportunities, which also means, so for instance, natural language processing is clearly becoming more important. You know, some people would certainly argue that, oh, there's quite a lot of information uh, in text, right? Uh, what companies so earnings calls, for instance, have mm -hmm. gotten a lot of interest. That's still relatively recent. It's not like the newest thing on the block, but people have been starting to look at this with more sophisticated transformer models and so forth. So there's some interesting work to be done, but this is still relatively early stages, right? There's more sort of news flow and all these things uh, that can be utilized. So that's like one area of, of, um, of opportunity and just general, right? I mean, with the ongoing digitalization and so forth, um, getting a little bit of sun here, right? Let's see if I can move around. Um, okay. You know, with the ongoing digitalization, you simply will have more and more and more different data sources. And, you know, the advantage will come from being able to select and combine them in smart ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think it's going to be very interesting where where we end up in the next few years. And I do want to cover that before we get to that question. Um, I would love to do our very first giveaway. So I'm going to share my screen, remind everybody that it is hashtag packed for you to play. 
And uh, let me just show you again. This is the book you're playing for machine learning for algorithmic trading with the, that guy, the author, Stefan Jansen. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and draw our very first winner. Good luck, everybody. Uh, you will have another chance towards the end of the show uh, to if you don't win now. <clears throat> and if you don't win towards the end of the show, you can always go to Amazon and, and get the book. All right, congratulations to Ariel Pai. I, um, I'll let you know how to get the book after the show, but you can also contact Tushar Gupta from PACT and he will be able to get you the book. All right, moving on. Stefan, thank you. So far, I'm learning a lot. So thank you so much for, for being here. We do have a lot more questions that came in, but before we get to the- Yeah, audience, I'm looking at them as well in the, in the chat here. Oh, you're, you're looking. Is there anyone in specific you want to address next? Well, so, uh, there was one about uh, programming languages, right? Python versus C and so yes, forth. Yes, I've right? been meaning so, to, from Ryan, right? This one? Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, fair point, right? Um, if you look at, again, sort of this the, the workflow, right? Um, a big question is, what is kind of your holding period, right? What is kind of the horizon at which you're trading? If you compete in high performance trading and light latency is everything, you will certainly not have a Python model running and trying to kind of process huge amount of data in nanos at in nanosecond uh, speed, right? So, so for this domain, clearly Python uh, is not the right way, and you will have a ton of developers sitting there uh, writing this in C plus plus in reality, or you know some related language. So, so clearly, no, that is not everything that people do with trading, right? So uh, many people and many institutions trade at longer horizons. You know, even if you do something at minute frequency already or five minute, it's pretty straightforward to get predictions out of a, out of a model to run in Python. But even more importantly, the whole point of using Python is that this allows you to prototype, to develop models and see that they use just as you do in so many other industries, right? I mean, there's so many other industries that rec that require low latency uh, inference, right? So, so you may find out uh, also data science because you want to iterate quickly, right? You don't want to have this super complicated code base where you sit like and need like five days to kind of get all the bugs out to actually get a prediction, but rather find something and see, okay, this is the architecture, this is the model that works and we try this in Python. Let's now translate that. Uh, and, and code this in C++, and you know that's an established workflow to put sort of put it in production, right? So right. even in the in, in in the context of of faster trading, it's not necessarily nonsensical to start developing things using uh, using Python. But there are, there are limitations when it comes to building the actual infrastructure that runs in production. But that mm -hmm. is the same as elsewhere, right? I doubt that Google is running its search engine or you know any things that run in the background there uh, using Scikit-Learn, right? So right. Right. Thank you. And then uh, there's sort of a, another question that's related to models here from Kevin. He's he's asking, are the models only for equities or can they be also used for other assets? So in principle, um, so the book uses equities e, uh, at different uh, frequencies. So the bulk is so. The book relies almost exclusively on free data in the second edition. That's actually, we we'll talk about the third edition in a minute, but that's something I'll change in the third edition just because it's, it's a somewhat limiting factor. So the book uses uh, free equity data, mostly at daily frequency, but there's, there's one data partner that offers minute data. So there's also examples at, at much higher frequency. Uh, but some examples use either international equities or ETFs as well, right? That's currently what's in the second edition, but uh, that does not mean that the tools themselves are not applicable to futures or options, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's about demonstrating a workflow and generating predictions, right? The features will be different, the input data will be different and so forth, but the overall logic will apply, right? And if you want to trade options or futures, you will need your own domain knowledge for that space anyway, right? So, mm -hmm. which is a general point, right? The book does not give sort of ready recipes to kind of set up your little hedge funds or start making money tomorrow, but rather something that you can apply to a domain where you have specific expertise to pick data or set up a model that actually differs from what most people do. Right, and, and Stefan, you mentioned um, uh, the third edition. So a few questions there. I know you have a new version of the book coming out. When can we expect to see this updated version? and then sort of take us through what are some of the updates going to look like. Yeah, so that's a little on the horizon. So um, sort of 
you know, a specific date will be a little difficult. Hopefully, uh, at some point this year, if things go really well, then maybe uh, towards the third quarter. But you know, uh, it's not like my main job. Um, but I will start collecting ideas, and there are quite a few uh, items that are already on the list. One big change is that uh, it would be great to actually use data that you would have to pay for, uh, which means they're actually also higher quality. That doesn't mean that they're very expensive. So mm. it looks like we, we have a partnership with NASDAQ for the third edition. NASDAQ acquired Quandle. So there's a ton of different data sets on their platform that you know cover fundamentals. So there's a lot of equity data, of course, right? Fundamentals and, and um, equity options and so forth. So there's a lot of interesting new pieces on that front, but then there's also fixed income, futures, Bitcoin or uh, cryptocurrencies, more broadly speaking, uh, mm -hmm. and, and so forth, right? So you would ex you, you should expect to see that diversity reflected in the examples, so, which I think is great because obviously that's what people actually do in real life. The price to pay is that, well, you cannot download all the data for free and just like run the thing. So you would have to, you know, I, I try to sort of point out where you could potentially get free uh, sort of lookalikes, you know, uh, to mimic that, but that will not always be work, uh, not always work, and it will always, not always be perfect because obviously free data comes with. They may just be wrong. You don't know. So. Right. Yeah. Well, you. So that's one aspect. For, right. So it's. Yes. It's free. Well, what, you might not get what you exactly. need. Exactly. Makes sense. So that's that, that's one aspect. And just generally in terms of what's new is, uh, so there's quite a few things that will be new uh, besides the different asset classes. Um, so the industry or the research has evolved a little bit in uh, making models more finance specific. So there's quite an interesting strain of research that was, I think, initially started by Brian Kelly, who's at Yale and AQR that starts to build deep learning models that they're not very deep, they're relatively shallow, but the architecture reflects what researchers have traditionally used to model uh, returns in sort of financial economics. So mm -hmm. the idea that returns are driven by a certain number of factors uh, as opposed to using hundreds of thousands of variable, you know? So there's like the original sort of kitchen sink approach where you say, oh, I'm just going to take everything I have in terms of data and build a huge model and then hope that it predicts return, right? And then these right. more, more um, modern models, they say, let's distill out of these factors mm -hmm. something that um, that ultimately makes the model more data efficient because it has fewer par parameters, right? So, so there's right. some benefits uh, to that. Um, and they, they perform quite well. And it's interesting because it sort of marries now sort of what we have learned because finance, of course, has a very long history in quantitative methods, right? It's not like yeah. we're just starting yesterday, which is one of the reasons why maybe they took a little longer to get off the ground than say, um, say the, the consumer internet companies, right? Which were right. starting from scratch. So, but now that they're on it, um, they're starting to integrate what they've learned over the last four, five, six decades with sort of these new flexible uh, uh, models such as, as neural networks. So that's kind of interesting. So there will be more. There's a little bit in the book already, right? Mm -hmm. So so there will be more on that. Generally, I think the aspect of making the examples more sort of either closer to the research frontier or covering different aspects of what people in the industry do uh, will be more pronounced, right? So there's that aspect. There are other areas, for instance, of uh, what institutions do. For instance, so the, the second edition usually looks mostly at let's just predict returns and then trade on that. Uh, there's, for instance, market making, right? So mm -hmm. a lot of it's large institutions that operate as, as market makers, so they provide liquidity, they buy and sell all at the same time. They may decide at which price to place a, a bid or an ask, you know, and then for how long to hold it, et cetera. And the interesting reinforcement learning uh, models emerging in that space, for instance, right? So, mm -hmm. so that's interesting. So that will be covered. That's not necessarily so much for the individual a hobby trader, you know, but it does cover an important area where sort of the industry is adopting the technology in a more professional way or more sort of it, it takes it on and then really develops it in a way that's suitable for the tasks at hand, you know. Okay. Another aspect that's new is um, so at the very high end frequency, uh, at the very high frequency end of the spectrum is, um, is tick data that's typically captured in order books, right? There's limit order books, you know, where the exchange say the NASDAQ constantly records who is placing a limit order, right? Which means I'm mm -hmm. ready to buy or sell the stock at a certain price, and then the order may just sit there, mm -hmm. you know? And that gives a lot of insight into what the liquidity in the market is or the demand supply for market for, for stock. It's very different from just seeing, well, the stock yesterday or just now traded for 150. 
you know, when you know there's like, I don't know, millions of dollars that want to buy at different levels and much fewer that wants to sell or vice mm -hmm. versa, right? So it gives insight into the demand supply dynamic. And then new interesting models uh, coming out of Oxford, uh, Mann Institute. Mann is like a large quant fund. They fund this uh, institute at Oxford that applies, um, so one applies convolution, convolutional neural networks to the structure and the patterns that you observe in this limit order book. So that's kind of interesting because that's like fairly cutting edge and highlights another area in which the industry um, is evolving. You know, again, at the high frequency end of the spectrum, very data intensive and you need a ton of infrastructure to actually do that. But, you know, I think it's a fair uh, point to sort of show that as well to make it more diverse. Yes, Stefan, a follow-up question on the um, the limit orders. Is that is that data available for people to actually see? Like if I'm trading a stock, let's say Apple, and I have a limit buy order, yeah. is, um, I, I guess when I was trading stock, I always thought that that was only for, for my eyes only. Can other people see that? Uh, not that this is Kate that now wants to do that necessarily, but yeah. if you if the order appears in the order book, depending on the axis that you have, uh, you know, folks can certainly view that if they pay for this, right? Because oh, it's wow. registered in the in the in the exchange, and okay. um, so so that's one one piece, right? When you trade on Robin Hood, and then the order gets shipped off to Citadel, you know, so other people also implicitly see uh, what you're doing, which may or may not be to your advantage. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the order book li literally works that like that, right? Uh, people. Okay. Uh, and people sort of play games with this, right? You place orders, you withdraw them because you sort of want to maybe fool other parties in terms of what you're intending to do or what the market looks like at a current play. So it's a fairly, it's a competitive environment, right? So it's like right. playing games and, you know, maybe it's good if you place a bunch of orders that you're potentially willing to buy stuff at a high price and then everybody gets really interested in buying this because they think, and then, but then you start selling because then the price goes up, you know, so whatever, you know, okay. so there's a bunch of, of, and this is kind of how sort of more sophisticated, um, uh, uh, you know, at, at, at the larger shops, you know, how, how this kind of would, would work. Very you know. interesting. Thank you. Um, we have a question here from Amit. He's asking if these um, okay. algorithms are hard-coded hard for the U.S. exchange or can they use uh, for other exchanges as well? No, not at all. I mean, so use this one. Um, I mean, some of the limitations, again, are the use of free data, right? So mm -hmm. the... Um, the, the book originally built a little bit on um, the tools that Quantopian had developed. You know, Quantopian is this um, used to be a crowdsourced hedge fund, uh, fairly generously funded by you know Google, uh, Google Ventures, and others that eventually uh, didn't wasn't successful, and you know the team was sort of acquired by Robinhood. So they also uh, um, they used a lot of a data set that had been developed by the community and hosted by Quandl, which was now acquired by NASDAQ, and that is U.S. equities. Mm -hmm. So quite a few examples rely on that data set simply because everybody can get it and it's free. Nothing stops you from you know substituting in your what have you right Bombay Stock Exchange or China or something in Europe, you know. Yeah. Okay. That's the whole point, right? The whole point of the book is to show this is the overall framework. Please bring your own data, you know, otherwise it's not that useful anyway. Yeah, makes sense. All right. Question from uh, Pamek. How exciting, and this is for you personally, how exciting is algo trading for you? And uh, he's asking ah, for so some boring. pros and cons. Maybe just give us like your favorite part, your least favorite part of the space. So I think you have to be clear, it's actually very hard, right? So it's yeah. very competitive and some people sort of uh, jump in sort of starry eyed that, oh, machine learning, you know, it's just going to be a piece of cake, you know? Yeah. So it's not because you're not the first to, to think that, you know, it's just like so many other things in investment. There are certain that the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s where certain things that look like extremely simple from today that worked really well and made you a lot of money. You know? So so that's kind of the starting point, you know? Now, mm. of course, then, uh, on the on the positive side is it is very challenging because you get rewarded directly for your efforts, right? You don't have that many places where sort of your decision and your own intelligence ultimately in in coming up with a with a unique solution is directly related to your payoff at the end of the day. You know that doesn't happen that often. That's why people are attracted to it, right? Because they literally want to outsmart the market, and you know directly at if you look at your P and L if that was working or not. Mm -hmm. And surprise, surprise, sometimes it does and sometimes it does not. 
So if you if you're attracted to kind of a setting like that, then this is certainly uh, very good. If you rather attracted to a steady job, you know, yeah, maybe. <laughs> Where you always ahead. know what happens the next day and you kind of want to, you know, take it easy, then there, there are many better places to achieve that. Makes sense. Absolutely understand. Um, okay, question here from Daniel. Do you take external non-market specific data into account in your models? So the, the, the bus kind of divides it into market fundamental and alternative data. So okay. if you say non-market specific data, you're probably referring to, to alternative data, I'm assuming. Right, so market data is everything that sort of the exchanges generate, like the pricing mm -hmm. and the volumes and so forth, which often goes into this technical analysis kind of part, right? The charts and all the different indicators that use these inputs. Fundamentals is what companies report, you know, earnings, revenues, costs, and so forth. So alternative, alternative data is literally everything, and um, there's 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 a chapter on alternative data, and there are several examples, especially in the um, in the natural language processing part, naturally, right? I mean, there's, there, we use earnings calls, we use, um, um, we use SEC filings, and then some non-financial data to illustrate certain techniques that are less interesting. Mm -hmm. There, of course, the challenge is there are not that many, and I think there's a news data set, actually. So I think I've used some Reuters news or something. Um, mm -hmm. so, so there are examples uh, that, that utilize these, um, these data sets. Again, on the free data side, it's somewhat challenging to have large scale, super interesting data that are, you know, just f available for free. So, so, right. so that's kind of, but again, like once you know the general technique, you know, you can apply this um, elsewhere. We use images, there's a little bit on images, you know, images are kind of hard, you know, there's always this idea, oh, I can use satellite images to predict how many people are visiting the shopping mall or where the tankers are going and what the harvest is going to be like if I trade mm. commodities. And there's some, some uh, validity to that. The reality is that very often you might actually get better data that tells you much, that is much closer to the source if you really want to, to learn these things ahead of time. So it's much better to get actual credit card company data to understand what people are actually buying at the mall mm -hmm. than counting sort of the, the cars on the parking lot because who knows where they're actually going, you yeah. know, uh, maybe some people are just sleeping in their cars or there's an event nearby and maybe they all just go to the food court or so, so, you know, there's kind of, it's, it's less direct mm -hmm. and sort of more noisy ultimately, right? Same with tankers. I mean, if you get access to the actual logbooks at, 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 at sort of at harbors, right? At the, at the stations that sort of process the cargo, that's of course much closer to the source than, you know, see some, sh some tankers floating around in the air, you know, so, right. so, there's, so there are examples like that, uh, but I think text itself probably is, is, is more interesting than, than many images, but there will be exceptions, right? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting. I never actually thought about the use of images in, in this, so very, very interesting. Um, but like you said, it might end up confusing you even more, right, by giving you maybe misleading information. Um, yeah, it's, it, I think it was like one of those things that early on were sort of very prominent in the debate. Oh, we got all these insights from satellites. Yeah. Everything is now crystal clear. And I, I think that may, that may certainly exist, but you have to really know why you're using the, the images and not some other source of data that might give you a similar uh, yeah. insight of higher quality, you know? So. Because images are cool, that's why. They're new, they're interesting, and you... Yeah, and that also was, was, was what was driving the success of deep learning initially, right? I mean, 2013, right. AlexNet and all this stuff was all based on images. So clearly, you know, that had kind of the aura of, you know, the real new stuff. So Right. All right. More questions. One from Terrell. So you mentioned that you need first movers advantage when it comes to models being used in production. What is the average time frame for projects and hedge funds that you've worked with? And what is the project workflow like when introducing new ideas into the pipeline and seeing it through to the end? Um, yeah, so, um, so I'm not, I don't think there's like a gen general average time frame, right? I mean, it really depends on the specific setting, right? Uh, okay. I mean, things work different in a high frequency environment than for people that have months of, of, of holding 
periods, right? So large institutions, say pension funds or so, they will not be trading every other minute, right? It would probably be not, not be worthwhile given the transaction costs, you know? So mm -hmm. they still might want to use predictions, you know? So there the cycles would be much longer, right? And uh, since the cycles are much longer, so you buy something, you hold it for a month and you really evaluate it maybe about after two, three months, um, you know, you will also not be sort of renewing the models that much. Right? right, so that's kind of one end of the spectrum, you know. Mm -hmm. And at the other end of the spectrum are things that happen every day, where you have uh, sort of a profit and loss, you know, almost every second, right? So clearly, in that environment, you will notice much sooner if a model, for instance, is not performing uh, as good as baseline, you know, over some period. So clearly, you'll be iterating much faster there, you know. So, so it really depends very much on 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 the context, you know, that that you're in. Okay. Yep. Thank you for that. Um, Kevin wants to know your favorite financial news source, if you have a favorite. I mean, but Bloomberg clearly is kind of still a very prominent name in the game. Just look at the number of journalists they have. You know, if what you want is sort of fast news that covers a, a bunch of different areas that are related to trading. I mean, that's why people pay whatever, 25, 30K for the terminal, right? Mm -hmm. um, larger, a, a significant chunk of that is, is the news you get there. Right. So, but then of course there's a bunch of other things that are more deeper, longer term, right? And and you know there are people that write specific newsletters or that write. I mean, some of some of the financial press is also not that. I mean, I, I read Financial Times very regularly. Sometimes Wall Street Journal. So you know, so so this is more like looking. I don't know, like a deeper report, looking at a specific issue, things like that. You know, so it really depends on the on what you want to get out of it. Books are also not bad, right? So. That's not news, strictly speaking, but it may be news in the sense that it introduces a new technique or a new, um, you know, a new aspect that's, that's also used. So it, it's a little bit of sort of news, technologically speaking, maybe. Right. So let's talk a little bit about, um, about the future before we get to our wrap up and final giveaway here. I know you mentioned a little bit about natural language processing and sort of um, that being used in in, in algorithms now, and we talked about images, but what else do you expect to see in the in you know in the algorithmic trading space? Yeah, I think generally uh, the the process that you're seeing right now, that different sort of areas or aspects of the general workflow as as an institution like a hedge fund or some buy side uh, investment house that be that risk management, be that portfolio construction, right? Or be that stock selection, all these different steps in the in the process that right now different people might, might have their hands on, they all will be incorporating some sort of data science machine learning, right? Mm -hmm. And the mix between the human and the machine will vary depending on how complex these things are as everywhere else, right? Yeah. I mean, it's not like the doctors are going away, but the doctors are using maybe more insights generated from, from, from images. The same for a fundamental analyst that looks at companies longer term might also be quite happy to actually get decent machine learning model forecasts of the revenues or so of that company. That's helpful, right? It's maybe better than just doing a sort of straight line projection or pl uh, plugging in some, some growth numbers into an Excel sheet. So, so, so you have, the, you know, you have that, but then of course you will also have more institutions that sort of will try to set up this end-to-end -end automated workflow. I think that's uh, not uh, that, that that's far from an off-the-shelf solutions. You know, I think it's early days to to do this, and probably some scale is is required. And some have closed shop, right, or have kind of aborted these these attempts. So, so I think the jury is out. If we will have very soon a large number of fully end-to-end -end automated sort of like reinforcement learning bots uh, dominating the market. That doesn't mean that in, in certain areas that won't be successful, but yeah. at scale and across the board, we'll see in 30 years, that will be a very different story, you know, so. In 30 years, I know, oh my God, I just uh, finished reading the book, uh, 2041, AI 2041, not sure if oh. you've read it or heard of it. It's um, hmm. by Kai Fu Lee and Chen Chu Fan. Um, it's basically 10 predictions um, for the next 20 years. Hmm. Very, very interesting. If you're if you're into that sort of thing, it's yes. kind of like a realistic science fiction uh, with this AI expert who sort of predicts what could happen. Yeah. Oh my goodness. It, what it, are your top three? What are your top three predictions from that? Do you well, remember? okay. So the one that really stood out for me was the displacement of workers, right? The, mm -hmm. the people whose jobs are sort of being automated and how we're going to have to work with 
with robots. That one was um, very, very realistic for me because I could see this happening, you know, with autonomous driving and all that. Um, the second one, there was uh, basically giving up your data for better insurance premiums. That mm, was yeah. another interesting one where they basically follow you around. It's pretty much what we have with our phones now, but on a larger scale where they actually use all that data to determine what sort of premiums you need to get. Yeah. Um, and then, they try that with cars a little bit already, right? I mean, you can plug these yes. devices in the car, so you get a little bit of that. I don't know if that really is. Yes. But it's going, yeah, yeah, it's it started. Yes. I mean, and then there were some really depressing things like, you know, warfare and all that. That was just very mm. eye-opening of how it, it depends on which way the world <laughs> going to go, right? Um, with with AI, it could be yeah. it could be really, really good or really, really bad. Um, yes. Hopefully yeah. we'll be somewhere in the middle, like we usually are in this world, but very, very interesting book. That's going to be our book of the month for, for February. We have a, oh, a cool. data book club that we manage. So Interesting. Speaking yeah, these are really relevant. There, there was one interesting thing I came about uh, like a year ago. So uh, the question was general artificial intelligence, right? Is this going to happen like anytime soon? And uh, there were it, it was a survey of all the folks that were you know participating in the large machine learning conferences, right? So academics at the research frontier. Yeah. And one thing that was so striking was that most people were like, yeah, it might happen, not anytime soon, maybe 2070 or something like that. There was one group of researchers that was much more aggressive as to when that would happen. Do you have a guess what group that might be and whether it would be age or geography or any other factor that might distinguish them? I don't know. Were they Germans? I don't know. Were you, were no, you... no, no, no. Germans are so skeptical. The Germans are like, no, nah, we, we probably don't really need this. <laughs> you know, we already have that like, good mechanical engineering, you know, which works quite well, you know. No, no, it's the Chinese. Okay, the okay. Chinese I was going to say Russia deeper. or China next. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they were literally way ahead of everybody else in their expectations, you know. And yeah. so that's kind of, that's really interesting. You know, your, your fast moving environment shapes your expectations probably to some extent. And of course, in China, certain things uh, work better, right? If you need access to data, you know, maybe if certain places get, uh, get a head start over their Western competition. Yeah, yeah. And then, so uh, Kai Fu Lee wrote another book about AI superpowers, and he talks a lot about yes, I know China that, yeah. in, in that book as well. So. Yeah. Lots of interesting stuff. Um, all right, everybody ready for our giveaway? Let's see. I'm going to add this to the screen again. So congratulations again to Oriol. Uh, we're going to draw this in just a second. Before I hit draw, just a question, Stefan. Where can people get your book if they don't win right now? Um, well, there's, uh, there's Pact has an online store, right? Um, okay. There's certainly Amazon, um, and so there's the electronic versions, and there are hard copy versions. Um, I heard from, uh, yeah, so it depends on your reading preferences. And of course, there are these online subscriptions, right? There's sort of Safari Online mm -hmm. and uh, O'Reilly and these things, you know? So there, there are a few different sources. Also, if you're just interested in the topic then <clears throat> and you, you like code, then I'd really recommend to check out the GitHub repository because there's literally like 150 different notebooks uh, out there you can just look at. Uh, so you either Google like the name of the book and my my name, uh, and then on GitHub you find it, or you go to mlfortrading.io where you have a bunch of information about the book, including all these links and so forth. Okay, perfect. Yeah, guys, check out the GitHub. And uh, Christine said she's got the book. Uh, the hard copy is going to arrive tomorrow. So cool. Okay, awesome. Thank all you. Right. So, oh, and there's also uh, on this ML for Trading website, there's actually an online community. Uh, I think it's exchange.mlfortrading.io. Uh, you know, you can ask questions about the book and, you know, people hopefully will respond or I will respond, you know. So there's a little bit of, of a community growing that hopefully we can push a little more with the next edition if you get there. Okay, sounds good. All right, I'm going to go ahead and draw. We're going to pick two more winners. So. Uh, we got the first one down. Let's see our second winner. Congratulations, everybody who played. All right, Sammy, we will follow up with you as well. Or you can reach out to Tushar Gupta uh, from PACT, and he's going to provide you the book. I love watching the, the little glitter set up. i um, going to go ahead and draw one more time here. Thank you, everybody, for participating. I always love this. It's so much fun for me to watch it. 
slow down. Ah, congratulations, Quena. We are going to follow up with you as well. And Stefan, I want to thank you for imparting our knowledge on us, um, your knowledge on us once again here. It's always great to have you on the dedicated show and huge thank you to Pat for, for this uh, fun giveaway that you've sponsored. Uh, Stefan, if people do have more questions, where is the best place to contact you? Yeah, so if it's code specific, then use the GitHub uh, repo. There's an issue uh, sort of um, corner, you know, we can okay. ask questions. And then there's this community that I mentioned, exchange.ml for trading, you know, with the number four in the middle, .io, where you can ask more general questions about the material, your understanding of the book, et cetera. You know, you'll, you'll see there what kind of uh, questions people ask. Okay, awesome. And I'm guessing you're also on, on LinkedIn. Um, yeah, I'm on LinkedIn, right? Uh, I'm on Twitter, Twitter, also on the ML for trading and starting to be more active there, but uh, have been posting more on LinkedIn then. <clears throat> anyway, okay, so. well, everybody, um, thank you so much for joining. Follow Stefan Jensen on LinkedIn, follow Pact on LinkedIn. They're doing great work. Thank you again, Stefan, for being on the show and thank you everybody for joining. Yeah, thank you so much for having me again. I had fun, and who knows, next year, three times a charm. Yeah, we'll see you after the third edition of Doubt, Stefan. All right. Awesome.